So I asked my Twitter about the worst advice they've gotten on learning Japanese. And here are some of the replies. Don't bother. Japanese people prefer you speak English anyway, and the only people who will be your friends will all speak English anyway. Now, I probably don't have to say that this is not true, but I can also see the type of people who would say this kind of thing. You know, some of the people who teach English in Japan, who only speak a little bit of conversational Japanese, mostly just hang out with other English teachers. Some of those people are like that, but you don't have to be. I also know other people who make friends with Japanese people who don't speak English because they speak Japanese. So it's really just up to you. Use that bird up. <laughs> I wonder if people who actually give this kind of advice have learned Japanese at a higher level. I don't think you'd give this advice if you are serious about learning a language and know a lot about how one acquires a language. The kind of Japanese you learn as a beginner is important because it tends to stick. So why would you want to feed yourself with inaccurate pronunciation, weird phrases that Japanese people never use, and misleading instruction? I've also made a couple of videos about Duolingo, so maybe you want to check them out. Just date a Japanese girl. Well, now I have two problems. So I can see why this is not always a good advice, because if your Japanese girlfriend speaks in a very feminine way, and if she is the main source of inputs, you will end up sounding like a girl, which in itself isn't a problem, but if you are a straight man dating a Japanese girl, that probably won't represent your gender identity and sexual orientation. And I've known guys like that, just as this tweet says, I know an engineer in the USA who learned Japanese from his wife. Problem is, his Japanese is littered with all the female usages. It kinda hurts to listen to him. Behind his back, the Japanese engineers sneer at him. Now, the gender difference in Japanese is an interesting topic I want to cover in the future. But not all women speak in a very feminine way, so it really just depends on who you learn Japanese from. A better approach is, of course, learning Japanese from a variety of inputs. To avoid kanji until you know the whole grammatical structure. It caused me to drop the language entirely several times until I realized what was wrong. Sometimes you need to just jump into the water. Yeah, so that's the thing. You don't have to avoid kanji, but you don't have to learn 2000 kanji before reading any Japanese texts. Also, I generally don't recommend learning stuff in isolation while ignoring other aspects of the language. Can be like grammar, kanji, vocabulary. Balance is key. Just immerse yourself. I tried this for my first two years in Japan, fumbled my way through social interactions, wasn't learning much. I've been paying the teacher to speak one-on-one -on -one for a few years now, and that's improved my Japanese tremendously. So, immersion is a very poorly understood concept by many people. Some people think immersion will be like, just keep listening to something even if you don't understand anything. That's not how you learn a language. If you want to acquire a language, you have to process and understand your inputs. So when you hear something, you understand, you acquire a little bit of Japanese. When you read something and you understand, you acquire a little bit of Japanese. So comprehension is a very important part that many people miss. Another common misconception is that you need to understand your material without any help, like looking up words in a dictionary. But getting some help is completely fine. Look up words you don't know. Maybe you want to read a translation to see if your understanding is correct. You can use whatever help you need. As long as you understand your input, it counts. So take your time because it will probably take some time in the beginning because you don't know a lot of Japanese. But if you keep doing it, it gets easier. And if you need my help, I will directly teach you the kind of Japanese that real-life Japanese people today actually use because textbooks and apps teach you their own versions of Japanese that don't quite reflect how Japanese actually is. So click the link in the description and subscribe to my email group. Stick to only the Genki books. So one of the common problems with textbooks is that the kind of Japanese that they teach you is a very poor representation of actual Japanese that we actually use. 
and they also oversimplify Japanese, in my opinion, which works for some people if you just want to speak just good enough Japanese and be done with it. Maybe it's fine, but if you are interested in understanding the complexity of real life Japanese, and if you want to sound like a native speaker, textbook input is not really good for you. So if you're using a typical textbook, be sure to get your examples from authentic materials. So you have to think about what kind of Japanese you want to learn and how far you want to go. Also, please don't judge real life Japanese using the knowledge that you learned from textbooks that are specifically written for non-native speakers. They use a kind of learner's grammar, which has its own purposes, but it's just not designed to analyze the complexity of real life Japanese grammar. We also have books for, let me, let me get them. So we have books on Japanese grammar for native speakers and the kinds of grammar that they talk about are more suitable to analyze complex real life Japanese. But there are also limitations. For example, when it comes to basic Japanese grammar, we actually don't have a single way of explaining it that everybody agrees with. Modern Japanese grammar is actually not a very well uh, established discipline. So different people explain basic Japanese grammar in different ways. I emphasized basic Japanese because even with fundamental things like, oh, what is a subject? Or do we even have a subject which many people say we don't? There are so many things that we don't agree with. And many people read something about Japanese grammar in English online and think, oh, this is the Japanese grammar. But Actually not, it's just one of the ways of explaining Japanese grammar and, and a lot of resources in English I came across online, they don't seem to be aware of different ways of explaining Japanese grammar. So you definitely shouldn't think that what they read online is the truth and you have to take everything with a grain of salt, including my videos. I explain Japanese in the best way I can think of with my current knowledge and experience. But as I learn more about Japanese, as I gain more experience, I might change the way I explain things. Because nothing is set in stone, and I constantly learn more about Japanese and try to improve the way I explain Japanese. Another huge limitation is that most of those grammar theories are based on written Japanese instead of conversational spoken Japanese. And I think it's fair to say that spoken Japanese is harder to analyze because a lot of things are context dependent. So things that apply to written Japanese don't always apply to spoken Japanese. Having said that, if you are interested in learning practical Japanese, you don't have to understand Japanese in this uh, abstract theoretical way. This is for people who are interested in analyzing Japanese in an academic way. It is interesting, but it's not necessary to acquire Japanese. You can perfectly understand Japanese without coming up with a complex theory of how each word uh, interacts with each other in an abstract way. The best book to start is Minna no Nihongo. So Minna no Nihongo had so many problems that I don't even know where to start. Poor representation of the language, questionable choices of words, questionable exercises, there's just so much stuff. I feel like I need to write a long essay about Minna no Nihongo or something. And some people say, oh, I learned Japanese from Minna no Nihongo, so it should be fine. But the thing is, yes, you can learn some Japanese from Minna no Nihongo, but is it really the best resource or is it even a good resource? And my answer is no. In this day and age, when you have so many options, I can't think of any reason why you have to actively choose Minna no Nihongo. It's pretty unfortunate because it's actually the most popular choice of textbook in Japanese language schools because they have been using this for so long. Some of them seem to be understaffed, teachers just come and go, and they just can't afford to uh, implement better ways of teaching. And there are many better ways of teaching and learning Japanese quite unfortunate. So it has its role in some parts of the teaching community, but with English speakers who have lots of choices, there's no reason to pick this particular uh, textbook. And I'm far from the only one who is aware of the problems, right? Because there's also a lot of research that shows 
how みんなの日本語 is detached from the kind of Japanese that we write and speak today. Learn Romaji first, it will make it easier. So, <laughs> one of the first things you need to do if you are serious about learning Japanese is to learn the letters, basic letters, hiragana and katakana. These are phonetic letters, and it's also a great way of learning the pronunciation. Of course, if you're just you know, trying out Japanese, if you want to see if you like Japanese or not, using Romaji or the Latin alphabet is fine. But if you decide that you want to learn Japanese seriously, the best thing you can do is to learn hiragana as you learn how to pronounce Japanese sounds. Use textbooks with Romaji. Again, learn the letters. There aren't that many. And relying on Romaji means your sources of input will be severely limited. You know, the internet is a great thing. Because of the internet, you have access to a lot of native content. It doesn't make sense not to use it to learn Japanese. And even if you don't know a lot of kanji, we actually have a lot of resources with furigana, the small furigana above kanji. Books for kids often have furigana. Many manga also have furigana. So, learning hiragana has a huge return on investment. Memorize kanji by looking and writing the one kanji for a week straight and you'll have it down. That's very bad advice and unfortunately, I kind of tried to learn kanji that way when I was in Japanese school. Very bad idea. Makes no sense. Don't do it. There's different ways of learning kanji that are effective. So just pick one that works for you and just do it. Passing JLPT N1 means you're fluent. It is not on many different levels. JLPT, especially lower ones, mostly test your test-taking skills, but not language acquisition. These are actually very different things. The problem is, a lot of people actually want to be able to speak Japanese and communicate with Japanese people, or maybe they want to understand something like anime without subtitles. So their goal is language acquisition. Yet, a lot of them learn Japanese as though their goal is to pass JLPT. So what they're doing doesn't quite align with their goal. The type of knowledge that you need to pass tests are often called explicit knowledge. It's something that you can consciously remember and retrieve. But when you actually communicate using the language, and I'm using communication in a broad way, so it's not just talking to somebody. Understanding input, writing something, that's part of communication. And when you are communicating using your language, you are actually using implicit knowledge that cannot be taught consciously or retrieved. That's why you can't quite explain how English works, even though you can speak it with no problems. And the interaction between explicit knowledge and implicit knowledge is actually a common theme in second language acquisition. And most people seem to think that explicit knowledge doesn't quite automatically become implicit knowledge. So just because you have a lot of test-taking skills, it doesn't mean you've acquired a lot of language. That's why passing JLPT doesn't mean you're fluent. But here's the thing, if you are fluent, you can easily pass JLPT. That's why it's easy for native speakers to pass JLPT. Another aspect is JLPT and one isn't actually that difficult for native speakers. I've actually made a video where I took a sample JLPT test, so you might want to check it out. Ignore grammar. You will learn that automatically. And grammar is another poorly understood concept, and when people use the word grammar, they can mean different things. Because some people say, oh, I speak English, but I don't know any grammar. What you mean is you don't have conscious knowledge of grammar, but you intuitively understand grammar because otherwise nobody will understand you. Even with conscious understandings of grammar, there's different levels of understanding. For example, some people try to understand the theory of grammar, but understanding a theory or theories of grammar, because when it comes to Japanese, there's actually no single grammatical model that everybody agrees with. These levels of highly analytical, theoretical understanding of grammar isn't necessary. What you need is more like a practical understanding of grammar. So when I say something like, 昨日ラーメン食べた, 
I ate ramen yesterday. You also understand Tabitha describes a past event. So you know that I said that I ate ramen yesterday. So this is more like a practical way of understanding grammar. Now, being able to consciously explain that taberu is a transitive verb and thus needs a direct object, like ramen. Being able to explain this isn't necessary for language acquisition. It can help with some people in some situations, but it's not necessary. The important part is that you understand how the verb taberu is used. I didn't have to consciously learn the concept of transitivity to acquire English. But with people who have trouble picking this up intuitively, maybe some explanations can help. But this kind of knowledge is only helpful for acquisition if you actually use it to understand your input. So you don't have to avoid grammar explanations to understand your input, but you don't have to cram all the knowledge in isolation either. The most important thing is finding level appropriate input and understand it, and use all the help you need. Don't use the same particle in the same sentence. Who said that? It's the, there's no rule. I can give you a lot of professionally edited sentences that use the same particle multiple times. Even some law clauses use the same particle multiple times. So this is not the rule. The frustrating part is, even if I tell people there's no rule, some people still think it's a rule. And they say something like, oh, you know, you need to learn the rules to break them. Oh, native speakers sometimes break rules, but this is not a rule. Some people might give you this kind of advice for clarity, but it's still not the rule. Some people's opinions are not rules. You can't learn Japanese and other languages if you are not living in the country. Completely not true. I learned English without living in any English-speaking countries. In fact, after spending years learning English seriously, I ended up learning much more English than many Japanese people who studied in an English-speaking country. In one of the first textbooks I read, it downplayed the intonation accent, leading me to put it out of mind for several years. Yeah, so this person is talking about pitch accent, the difference between sensha, tank as in military vehicle, and sensha, car wash, as in washing a car. It doesn't make sense many teaching materials completely ignore pitch accent. I'm not saying you need to completely master it before saying anything in Japanese, but teaching you what it is and giving you a basic understanding is important because it does make semantic differences. Don't speak the language until you have almost perfect comprehension of your standard content. If you had already spoken, stop until you reach that level of comprehension. So this is bad advice because it's extreme. But it is true that there's a very common misconception that if you want to learn Japanese, you have to speak as much as you can from the beginning. That is not true. What makes you acquire Japanese is, again, understanding input. And understanding is the most important part. Now, speaking, which is considered output, is a tricky subject. Because not everybody agrees with the role of output. But I think it's fair to say that output doesn't contribute much to acquisition. At least I can say that people have different opinions to what extent output might contribute to acquisition. Another thing is a lot of people have a very unbalanced approach when it comes to acquiring Japanese. For example, they try to speak Japanese without getting a lot of input. Without input, you simply don't have a lot of Japanese in your brain, so there's nothing you can use. But at the same time, if you want to speak Japanese, at some point, you have to practice speaking. And you don't have to reach near-perfect comprehension if you want to practice speaking. But I think there's also an important aspect of output that people don't always address, and that's motivation. It's motivating to be able to say something in Japanese. And even if it doesn't lead to a lot of acquisition, maintaining motivation is actually one of the most important things about learning Japanese. So I don't tell people to stop practicing speaking. I just tell them, don't forget to get a lot of input. You can watch TV shows, anime, YouTube videos, or you can read books if you want. 
Just don't forget to get a lot of input and try understanding it. But if you need some help, I will directly teach you the kind of Japanese the real life Japanese people today actually speak. Because textbooks and apps usually give you weird versions of Japanese that don't quite reflect how we write and speak Japanese. So click the link and subscribe to my email group, Japanese with Utah.